everybody. Um, a big welcome from my side. Um, we're very excited that you guys woke up early to join us here. We're also very excited to have a speaker here all the way from Japan. Mansell is going to talk to us today about the early dynasties at the Dutch occupied Cape of Good Hope. He currently resides in Tokyo, Japan. He was born in the Free State and schooled in Welcome, Brackham, Brackpan, Springs, Salisbury, uh, Kabora, Basa, Mayerton, Clapsorp, and Somerset West. It's like a worldwide school, this one. He graduated in French and English and law at the University of Stellenbosch. And he worked as a public prosecutor, diplomat, and indigenous legal representative and has given numerous presentations and published extensively on the Cape colonial, colonial history. His uprooted lives and furthering the Cape of Good Hope's earliest colonial inhabitants of 1652 to 1730 can be viewed on eFamily website and he's also got the, a, a, a blog there and the addresses are in the invite. I'm not going to read that. Mansell, it is over to you. We are very fortunate to, to have you here. We are very excited to, to, to hear what you've got to say to us. Okay, thank you, Alter. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to address you all. Um, I'm a little nervous because in this modern day and age of Zoom, so many people can be watching you from afar and it feels a bit sort of voyeuristic. So kind of strange to get used to this. So the topic has, as Alta has mentioned, is going to be about uh, early dynasties at the Cape of Good Hope, slave dynasties. And I've put dynasty in inverted commas because I think it's an open question. You know, we obviously need to ask ourselves, what is a dynasty and um, would, would the dynasties that I'm going to be talking about, would they qualify as dynasties or dynasties, like the Americans like to say? So that's something to ponder. And, uh, you know, I'd like you to ponder that too with me. Um, but just to start off with, um, just a quote from one of my kinsmen, that one of whom I'm very, very proud of. And that is Geisbert Hemi, uh, a great, great grandson of my Ansela van Bengale. Of course, you know, my granny, my father's mother was Heti Basson, and uh, I'm a lookalike of my own grandmother, and it's from this family that Heisbert Hemi descends, and he was, of course, the last Kapitan, the last Operwurft at Dejima, Nagasaki, here in Japan, and he lies buried here in Japan, and uh, I can't tell you what it means to me personally, having visited the, his tomb, which is the oldest foreigner's grave in Japan, Gaijin, as they say, here in Japanese, Gai Kokujin. And uh, it's a national monument, and it's been visited by the emperor's grandmother when she was empress consort. It's a very famous place, but still not so well known, even amongst ordinary Japanese people. Anyway, he, when he presented his dissertation to the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, because he was born in Cape Town and educated in in Hamburg, Hamburg in Germany, and then, of course, he went to Leiden University, which you well know is one of the oldest universities in Europe. <clears throat> so very much on par with Oxford and Cambridge and Utrecht and of course other European universities um, in Italy and France. So he, in his dissertation, he just says, I am constrained, oh benevolent listener, I have changed to receive you to a hastily prepared banquet. Show yourself, I beg you, to be an accommodating and easy guest and consider these delicacies such as they eventually are placed before you as fair and just. Sorry, so um, my talk has two components. And um, first, the pe peculiarities of European colonial slavery, the legacy thereof. So um, we just I'll talk briefly about what legacy or what we are saddled with, what we have been left with in terms of slavery that was imposed on the southern part of Africa by the Dutch. <clears throat> Important to note. And then, of course, secondly, I'm going to talk about these slave dynasties uh, that, that were created. And, but also bear in mind, 
I'm talking about the early period and early dynasties. So I'm not saying that all slaves that came to the Cape of Good Hope ended up making dynasties, not at all. But certainly in the early period, we have a very interesting phenomenon because the early slaves, in a sense, had a kind of advantage over the slaves that came after them. And I just want to add another note um, when it comes to talking about slavery. I think it's obvious by now in 2022 that slavery is abhorrent and that it is a terrible institution. And it shouldn't even have to be stated because we wouldn't be where we are today if the feeling wasn't generally held. It's now considered an international value that slavery is not acceptable and human trafficking is still a human problem globally. So I don't think it's even necessary for me to go into how terrible slavery was. Um, and I don't think anyone can expect me to have to show my virtues by talking about the, or, or the, how that it's a crime against humanity, et cetera, et cetera. It's bad, it's unacceptable. It's full of pain and, and anguish and suffering and trauma, which is now being overused nowadays. And I think trauma should be used selectively because not everything is equally traumatic. And, you know, these words start being used very emotionally nowadays and sometimes things get taken out of context. So let, let's be cool, calm and collected and let's talk about slavery, but knowing full well that it's atrocious. Okay, so this is my first question. Slavery is now a very emotional topic, especially in the Anglosphere, the English speaking countries and in Europe and most vocally in the United States. Not so much in the Latino countries and no one talks about it in Asia and Africa is silent, except South Africa, where we are unfortunately very much influenced by what happens in the United States in terms of current values. So we have to ask this one question, is our slave history in South Africa really hidden and is it really suppressed? So my answer to that is no, I, I don't think it's that simple. Um, there's a huge irony because in my 50 years plus of doing primary archival research, I've been able to uncover so much information about slave women and even homosexual men, but very little about ordinary straight men and very little about slave men. So this is really fascinating. So you know, nowadays it's very popular amongst feminists to say, oh, you know, slave women have been marginalized and silenced and suppressed and hidden. Yes, yes, to varying degrees, but also not. So let's get some balance here. But certainly um, we know a lot more about many slave women than what we do about the poor men. And I would put out a special case for slave men really had it so much harder than the women. Why? Because women could in some cases, they had an escape hatch. They could be claimed sexually. Yes, it meant that they were also further abused and they could either become concubines and marry. And of course they could become mothers and they could people the colony. So with that came extra benefits and perhaps a, an extended life. Whereas the men, many of them weren't able to get beyond being just slaves. Okay, so just a comment uh, that I wrote a while back. The slave and Cape indigenous ancestry of old Cape colonial families mostly derived from maternal ancestry. General amnesia, ignorance, presumption, denial, and suppression of slave or indigenous heritage, understandable perhaps, presumably goes hand in glove with inherited patriarchal systems and or perceived misogyny and the repression of maternal descent, not necessarily without female complicity. By the adoption, acquiescence and entrenchment of the overriding convention of carrying over one's father's surname and or adopting one's husband's family name. This might explain our hitherto mostly neglected, forgotten and buried matriarchal heritage. So what I'm saying here is very simply, May almost heti bason, 
My family name now is Appen, Moor Engels, but my granny was Moor Afrikaans, to put it very bluntly. But no one would know that unless I divulge this information or share my history. Otherwise, I'll be judged by my English name, which is extremely rare and probably assumed to be not even South African, which has been the story of my life, by the way. So <clears throat> th this convention of carrying over the father's name is what has hidden so much of our female ancestry. So it's not a conspiracy necessarily. It's patriarchal, yes. But, you know, we must be careful not from seeing, you know, some kind of hidden plan to, to hide women as if, you know, but the women are very much around in Cape colonial society. And there are other reasons too why they have such a strong presence. And the other reason would be the Dutch laws of inheritance. Roman Dutch law gives women more rights than say English common law. So in English families, there's a tendency for women to lose their identity when they marry. But in Dutch society, the women have to a certain extent maintained a stronger identity, even when married. And certainly when they are widowed or unmarried, they have more legal power than their English counterparts. This is very interesting. And this will be, you know, this will hark back when I get there, of course, to talking about peculiarities about the Cape, as opposed to, say, other uh, European colonized places of the, of, the, of the world outside of Europe. Okay, so let's move on. I was, I'm now going to talk about the, um, what I have mentioned here, eviscerating, wiping out Van Riebeek's legacy. Now, we know that it's now become very fashionable to, to demonize Van Riebeek and to pour all our, our hatred onto him for having brought the Europeans to Africa and colonizing what is now South Africa. Um, Van Riebeek's real, he came, he saw, he conquered, and he left. He was only here for 10 years, or only at the Cape for 10 years. I said here, but I'm in Japan, sorry. So he was only at the Cape for 10 years. So this is a sensitive point. Um, Against the backdrop of historical and current increased cultural, ethnic, and racial polarization, and what I call de-rainbowism, de because now the rainbow nation is no longer the flavor of the month, it seems that we are now recompartmentalizing ourselves. And rightly or wrongly, this is what I'm seeing, and it's, it's very intriguing. So one, I see South African whites in general, reacting to woke and critical race theory and becoming more brazen and because woke is becoming more vocal, more brazen, and there's an intensified attack on, on the Afrikaans language. Um, it means that, you know, people who speak Afrikaans are pulling back into the lager because they're being attacked. Who wouldn't retreat and become defensive? And this for me is very similar to African-Americans who become very hostile and they deny their white heritage. So there's something not very kosher and halal about this situation. It's sad. And secondly, South African so-called coloreds, they are becoming more divided, it seems. And I'm, I'm now noticing on social media that many are promoting a segregationist people of color exclusivity. And like, we are colored, we are POC, but whites, you can't ever be POC. Excuse me, but I'm not so sure about that because if I descend from non-white ancestors, why am I excluded? And then, of course, there's a hardened militism. You know, they re there's a reification of blackness. They self-identifying more with their black side than with their white side. So understandable, because now we are recompartmentalizing, it seems, I say again. And thirdly, so-called black South Africans, so let's work with so-called white, so-called colored, so-called black, they have hijacked the term African and they've replaced it with black and the governing the government retains all the other apartheid labels which is disconcerting to say the least so it means that if you're black you are african but if you're colored white or indian south african you don't qualify as an african well to hell with that i'm an african and no one can ever tell me that i'm not one so that i want to put on the record very loud and clear so what is van Riebeek's real legacy 
I think his real legacy is his slave women. So yes, he brought European culture to the Cape and we can debate this endlessly. He brought many things and many bad things. But for me, what's really significant, what sticks out is the slave women that were part of his household have left a most remarkable legacy in the form of countless descendants who make up many, many of white, so-called white South Africans and so-called colored South Africans and perhaps even black South Africans at this stage. I think research will prove that they, you know, over how many years, how many hundreds of years um, have the, has these descendants not ramified and intermarried into different racial groups. So this is, this is really interesting. Okay, so that's done. Very quickly, I want to talk about the methodology and to do some disambiguation, which Wikipedia loves to do. So that just means let's deconstruct and clear up some concepts here. And I've used a, and reworked a phrase, we speak from facts, not theory, and we speak from theory, not facts. Two opposing ways of going about research. So just like there are many genders, and you might know or might not know that in the Bougainese in Sulawesi in India have five traditional genders. So this is not a new idea that suddenly people can have more than one gender. So once again, this late, latest craze on what is a woman, what is a man, and who qualifies as what, it's as old as mankind, humankind, womankind, peoplekind. So what kind of researchers do we have? I, I, I listed a few, which I find quite amusing uh, and also interesting to compare. You get the copy pasters. I think that's self-explanatory. Now with this online social media and digitalization, we have so much information at our disposal. It's horrific. The proliferation is unprecedented in human history. So copy, Japanese call it copy B copy and pasting. This everyone does. And this you can do almost mechanically. It, if it looks right, you just copy and you paste and you send. Of course, this is highly convenient, but so, so dangerous. Beware of the copy pasters. Be very aware of them. Hobbyists, these are well-intended people who keep their time um, occupied with research about their family, which is great. And I think um, mostly people who finally get the time will have the luxury to do so. Family historians, next group, they're a little more serious because they try to place their family in a more social context. So just one uh, warning here, one little um, mention, Salman Rushdie in his novel, Midnight's Children, this quote I think speaks volumes. Family history, of course, has its proper dietary laws. One is supposed to swallow and digest only the permitted parts of it. The halal portions of the past drained of their redness, their blood. So what the problem with family historians is we shy away from skanda, from scandal. We shy away from what doesn't sit well with us. And unfortunately, human beings are not always good. So there's a lot that gets left out in the, the telling thereof. So family historians, good people, but not always you know, willing to face up to the, the truth of things. Genealogists, as I've put there, data for skrk. These people are so besotted with collecting data, which is a wonderful thing, but if you're not evaluating it and separating it from good and bad, it's not very useful and it's just more proliferation. There's my methodology in disambiguation, and there's my groups of copy pasters, hobbyists, family historians, genealogists, and now historians. Historians are the most interesting for this talk. Um, I will talk a little more about them after the next two categories. Archival historians, very important, but inverted commas because these have been somewhat, shall we say, disparaged by the people who see themselves as real historians. So let's talk about historians, but just before I get to historians, last category, antiquarians. I have a soft spot for this word antiquarian 
but there's one problem because it's now become a negative, uh, it has negative connotations. Nowadays, we associate antiquarians with excessively narrow, focused fact, uh, people who are obsessed with factual historical trivia and to the exclusion of a sense of historical context. So, you know, little old fuddy daddy men in little, you know, uh, libraries who are trying to find something curious and interesting that no one else cares a sausage about. So very much like old Kasorban in, in George Eliot's Middle March, the novel where Dorothea, who's this young woman who wants to get to know the world and she marries this old fuddy daddy who's writing this book that he never finishes. And it's on an arcane topic which no one knows about or cares about. So and antiquarians are now dismissed. But let's go back to the real meaning of antiquarian. And that's, you know, uh, to, it can be summed up in, in the words of the antiquary Sir Richard Colt Hall. We speak from facts, not theory. And that's what attracts me to the antiquarian approach. Facts first. There, and the theory later. Historians, now let's talk about historians and institutionalized ones especially. They are preoccupied with theory and very little fact. And the problem is they tend to, finding facts is hard work. Doing archival research is hard work, time consuming and highly specialized. So many historians, you know, they want to cut to the chase, they want to be out there, and they're working for an institution which has an ideological makeup, they will reflect all that. So be very aware of institutionalized historians, because they're not going to tell you the whole, give you the whole picture, they're not going to tell the whole story. So this is why I would, you know, to reinforce the idea, Boniface, the great Frenchman who started the theatre in South Africa, he was obsessed with the problem of humbuggery, hombochore at the Cape. And we still have this problem. There's too much humbug. So let's, let's also bear in mind that humbug is something we should try and minimize in our lives. So the performance of South African historians when it comes to the VOC period is dismal and very late. It's only recently that some have woken up to researching the Dutch period at the Cape in more detail. And they are riding on the backs of the people who have done the hard slog. So let's look at what they say, these historians. And I find it really interesting. There's a very interesting quote um, by Nigel Worden at the UCT. And in his article talking about new approaches to VOC history, this is 2007, not so long ago. I quote, there were there, but there was another important characteristic of Afrikaans writing on the VOC, which limited its broader historiographical influence. Despite differences in subject matter, the approach was overwhelmingly that of empiricism, rooted in Germanic and Netherlandic traditions of scholarship, in which Afrikaans language historians were trained. Theory and interpretation were eschewed in favor of exhaustive factual recording from primary sources. Listen to this. This is not to decry the latter. Indeed, the meticulous work of many Afrikaans language historians has provided a bedrock for later researchers. The tradition continues in more recent key works in the VOC published in Afrikaans, notably that of Dan Slay and... Aros uh, Kuman. Ah, Carl, yes, thank you. I can't see, <laughs> and Carl Skuman. But sadly, they leave out the most important person. Uh, Nigel Worden leaves out Anna Biesikin. She is the mainstay. She's before Dan Slay, and she deserves so much more credit for the incredible monumental work that, and output that she has bestowed upon us. We are so fortunate to have had Anna Biesikin in our lives. But the, so to continue with the quote, but the empiricism of such work did not engage with interests and approaches the historians in the Anglophone world in the 1980s and later. And especially so in South Africa where interpretation and debate has become the essence of historical writing. The essence? The essence? Right, so this for me is very, very intriguing. Here we have an institutionalized historian 
who is just a little disparaging, I'd say, of um, the archival historians. And let me tell you a little anecdote. When I was a first year history student at Stellenbosch, and I only did one year because I was not very impressed with the department, sorry to say. Um, but I watched two of my lecturers disparagingly belittling Anna Biesikin and Margaret Cairns because how dare they uncover deeds records which none of them would knew about. And how dare Anna Biesikin in 1977 write this incredible book on slaves and free blacks. They were not willing to acknowledge that these two women had actually done hard archival research and opened up a window for, for, for the country. So I cannot stress enough how, how much I respect archival historians. And I don't see them secondary to, to historians proper. I think it's the other way around. Because there's nowadays we have far too many people with too much humbug. They have theories and more theories. And when you challenge them on facts and, and actually on any research that they've done, you will find that they've done very little. And it's deeply disconcerting. Yeah, institutionalized historians are free riders of sorts. So the pitfalls of South African historiography is that for too long, we've had Africana historians who have been very empirical, like the Germans and the Dutch. And we've had the, the Anglos, the English South Africans, who've been, you know, making a lot of hot air about nothing because they've been theorizing more than looking at the facts. So I think this is also, this has gone on for too long. Now we're starting to integrate. Now we're starting to realize that, you know, um, so much has been missed out. But the problem gets worse because now we have a black consciousness, which means that we have an, not a bipolar problem of English and Africana. Now we've got a unipolar problem where Afro-eccentric black history, blackness, black fragility, black privilege and black supremacy are now starting to to rear its ugly head. So our history again is being distorted and being pushed into a certain direction. So once again, I think it makes my discussion very difficult when I want to talk about slave dynasties. And this is why I feel the need to mention this beforehand. Okay, and just other problems with, um, with methodology, patriarchal tunnel vision reinforced by family names, as I've mentioned already, the de Villiers Palmer or the de Villiers originally, Christoffel Kunrad de Villiers, the father of South African genealogy, his wonderful system of B, of, you know, the A is the stomfather and B, the second generation, C, third generation, wonderful system to, um, to collect the data, the genealogical data of families, but it's male line based. So Margaret Cairns was the first person to use it for female slave families. So the, the beauty of the system is that it can be used for both matriarchal and patriarchal family lines. But I'm still, I still note that, in, you know, in published genealogies, we still adhere to the, to the male line mostly. And we miss out on so much of the fuller picture because of this. So I'm not decrying it too much. I'm just saying that it does give us a skewed perspective, which we should take note of. And then, of course, there's the American hegemony and postmodernism. We've got this contest between history and relativism. So now it's okay to blur, it's okay to conflate, it's okay to fudge issues. Now people get emotional about rape. They write, historians write about rape, and rape suddenly jumps from a very simple legal definition where there's consent and there's sexual violation, physical violation. Those two components that create the crime of rape now becomes the rape of a whole nation, the rape of a whole colony, the rape of a whole people. So these the words starts being used very broadly and it makes discussion almost impossible and it becomes emotionalized. Then we get up, we, we can go further. We've got this makeup history, catch up history and lived experience phenomenons that we are, phenomena that we are now experiencing. It's now, very fashionable to write makeup history because we have to catch up for what has been left out. So my, my problem there is, do we really know what has been left out? Or have we identified that correctly to be able to restore the balance? So this is problematic. And to say that your lived experience 
determines the truth. Well, that's very subjective. That means objectivity is under attack. And then, of course, we've got the outright rejection of the white man's history. So I've had I've been at the personal receiving end of this on social media, where I've had non-white South Africans say, we don't want to read white men's stuff. We want something from our own people. So whatever you write is irrelevant and, you know, rejected outright. Very sad state of, state of affairs. How can you have any kind of open dialogue? And then there's another tension between macro history and micro history. I'm a great proponent of micro history for most of my research life. But as I get older, I've come to appreciate micro, macro history all the more. But I can really understand that, you know, too much macro is not good and too much micro is equally not good. So somewhere we've got to find a balance. And finally, there's another problem. There's the big data phenomenon. Now it's very cool to, to show maps and instant, you know, um, digitalized information that can form a picture and, and uh, become imprinted in your mind. So there's no analysis. There's just what you see is what you get. And that is the truth. So big data manipulation. There's a very interesting project on the go um, between Stellenbosch University and Lund University. Johan Ferry and Eric Green are two of the drivers. Um, fascinating exercise. They are now digitalizing all the, the colonial records of the Cape, and they are trying to ascertain how the society became so economically divided, how the wealth gap was created. Now, this is, of course, sounds wonderful, and it is wonderful. My only question is, how are they inputting this information? Because that's going to determine the outcome too. And it still depends on archival research and interpretation and still not enough of that is being done. Okay, um, so bottom line to that is something I wrote years ago when I was bemoaning the fact that my ancestor, my double ancestor, Eva Mirov, baptized Eva, born Krotwa, of the Horing High Corner, when I was concerned about her legacy being appropriated by new forces, I posed the following. Surely it is incumbent on historians, researchers, and academics in general, irrespective of, of all the isms, all the ideologies, to exhaust the records, even if we decide beforehand that these records cannot be accepted uncritically. One thing is very clear. Most historians and academics shy away from unearthing new material or doing primary research. Why? Invariably, they are too lazy. Primary research is much too time consuming and frustrating. They om omit certain facts. Known and new facts do not suit their political agendas. They are not competent to access, understand or interpret the records, 17th century Dutch, Danish, German, etc., and 17th century handwriting. Very, very, prohibitive to many. And their knowledge of the VOC period is disturbingly shallow. And I wrote this like 20 years ago, and it's still relevant. Oh, my last point there, I, I'm scrolling down. Cliched and trendy academic constructs are preferred at the expense of trying to establish a large empirical and scientific understanding. So what you see with academics and the universities, suddenly someone wakes up one day and says, oh, we have to look at uh, the position of of um, political freedom in the 17th century. So let's all do papers and let's do a seminar. And then everyone quickly puts something together and they all quote each other and they all you know, um, acknowledge each, each other in footnotes. And it's a kind of a circular joke that goes on and on and on. And somehow all this theory becomes the truth, but very little bottom uh, researchers actually informed their, their conclusions. So it's very trendy. It's all about a topic that sounds sexy. Let's write about it and let's see what, 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 what comes out of it. So it's pretty much hit and miss stuff, I think. Now, two more important points for me. I've, I've entitled this section, Not All Roads Lead to Marmory. And I've done this with a purpose because I think I have noticed historians are perpetuating colonial and apartheid labels and giving us a a distorted his, historical reality. And I'm, the example I want to give here is 
Two historians did research on Marmory, the mission station outside of Darling. And uh, Helen, Elizabeth Helen Ludlow um, and uh, Kerry Ward, Australian, um, they both did intensive research on the history of the mission station at Marmory, the Moravian mission station. But, and they were doing it from UCT, of course. And what they were doing is they were saying the Marmory mission station is a colored mission station, therefore we are looking at colored history. Big mistake. Because, well, my family come from that part of the world. And um, not every, everyone that I have researched in that whole area has a link to Marmory, whether they were white or colored, slave or Hottentot or Khoi um, at that time. So in a sense, if you, if you want to restore the past and you're only focusing on previously labeled groups, you're going to come up with a very limited history of, of Marmory. So the full picture of Marmory, I feel, hasn't emerged at all. It's very important because next to Marmory, there, was, there were competing congregations. The, the different churches were trying to to um, convert the different, all the people in the area and everyone was living, you know, the whites were not so white anymore and the coloreds were not so black anymore. And slave and non-slave were intermingling legally and illegally, which meant that there was a, a lot of people that wouldn't, that everyone and the, the authorities, the colonial authorities were having great difficulty in sorting out and uh, putting into different camps. So to, you need to really go to all the different, you need to research the, uh, and the whole area and all the different people together. If you're gonna do them in, in groupings that are no longer relevant, it's not going to help you to understand what really happened. One more quote here from Hans Hirser, important, Brain Mensa versus the Kamisa versus people of color. There's a lot of talk about so-called colored people, are they brain mensa? Are they now commissa? This is a new term that has been um, imagined and being pushed very aggressively. And also POC, which I find a bit of a misnomer because frankly, all people are people of color. I think especially given the, the rea rea realities of DNA testing nowadays. But Hans Hesse wrote the following, the paper mainly deals with that the large number of slaves from Asia and Africa imported to the Cape of Good Hope during the period 1658 to 1807. Apart from the inhuman treatment of people from different continents and the evils of slavery as a system, the new migrants eventually fused with the indigenous Khoi Khoi, San and European population to create a new group of people that would eventually become known as the Cape Colored community, in Afrikaans, Klierlinge or Brain Mensa. Um, at present, this group consists of nearly 5 million people, 10% of the total South African population. My problem with this quote is that this is Hans writing quite recently in 2020, um, talking about brain mensa, which is a term that is only being pushed by, it seems to me, the white speaking Afrikaans community. Um, but I might be wrong. This is, as I say, but uh, something I'm noticing that they are, the terminology is becoming contentious. Commissa, people of color, brain mensa, so-called colored or just colored. Um, but Hansius is saying here that a new group of people was formed. I disagree with this completely because why is he separating them from the white population? Because I have so many members of my family that are part of the so-called new group that Hans is referring to. So I think this is, this, this is the kind of problem that, that creeps in every time and has crept in until very recently, as in this case. So I think it's important to, to, to be aware of this. And then finally, sanitizing the past. There is this strange, because we are supposed to be horrified by what happened in the past, any researcher is not horrified because we are much more exposed to that reality than people who don't research. But there's this strange need to sanitize, make it look good. Somehow we need good role models and everything has to be clean and safe and sound. The one example that I find so intriguing is Suarte Maria, you know, the Cape born daughter, born in slavery of Evert van Gini and of course Anna Wena, his wife. 
Swata Maria Evers was one of the richest women when she died in 1713. And I have seen her be reconfigured, transmogrified into, from a black woman with white descendants, then to a black role model for oppressed blacks ignoring her white descendants. And finally now, hopefully as a hybrid ancestor of black, brown and white South Africa. So once again, Swata Maria, interesting case. Is she for all of us to appreciate and enjoy, or is she being reappropriated by divisive groupings? So restoring dignity, big word in our new constitution. I've said, yeah, somewhat carte blanche. So what is happening too is there's this urgent need to somehow make the past respectable and also retrieve all these lost voices and hidden and oppressed peoples of the past. Now, without, I don't want to sound dismissive either. Um, I think it's a, a noble idea. It's very, that's why I researched. I wanted to know about all the people that were lost to me when I was growing up. My ancestors, I didn't know about. Um, I had to start from scratch. So this voyage of discovery is so, so enlightening. And um, it's sad when you suddenly see people who don't do research, they suddenly, suddenly take Anna Besikin's list of slaves from her book and say, okay, these are all the slaves, let's do a monument for them. So here we have the Grote Kerk um, in Church Square. We have these black marble blocks with the names of the slaves that Anna Besikin and Margaret Cairns listed in their book of 1977. A lot of research has been done since then, which has corrected and improved that research and expanded on that research. So what you're looking at when you go there and read those people's names is a limited list of private slaves, which means that all the company slaves were just left out because whoever decided to do that monument didn't really sit down and do their homework. And using taxpayers' money to build monuments which are based on you know, badly, badly researched historical correctification, I find this extremely disturbing. If you really want to carry on with the, the promoting the past in a dignified way, get it right for God's sake, do it properly so that we can really pay the, the respect due. But it's not easy to pay respect to monuments which are half-baked and have been put up in a hurried and very, very, shall we say, politicized way. So also um, we had a, a British artist, South African, but British born, she at, at the Vienna, um, art at, this was years ago the johannesburg bnl 1997 she took those same names and she put them on bottles and put them in a net and of course made this wonderful piece of artwork once again to show her concern about all these lost enslaved souls nice idea but yes who's get who's who's profiting from this is the question i'm asking i see myself as an independent or an autonomous researcher I'm not affiliated to any university or any institution. And I'm thankful for that because I think it gives me a little distance from having to, to pay my dues. My next point is I'm a great believer in let the record speak for itself. I'm averse to academic opportunism. I am averse to top bottom or prescriptive research. I believe in bottom top, organic, laissez faire approach. You start at the bottom and you work upwards and then you let it reveal itself and then you can analyze. This is my point of departure. And to, to, to bolster it, to support it, I'm going to just give you one quote, which I found intriguing. This was in um, The Spectator of 2021. Um, it's a little flippant, but interesting. The writer, Robert Toombs says, um, he was writing about, um, how historians have interpreted the French Revolution. So let's just quickly read it. In those days, it was possible to change historical understanding by exploring the evidence. The evidence. The Marxist explanation of the French Revolution, also a matter of great concern to the Communist Party, which practically monopolized the relevant professorship in, pro professorships in France, was overturned by American and British historians. The orthodoxy was that the revolution was carried out by a rising bourgeoisie overthrowing a feudal aristocracy, a crucial stage in the Marxist historical process. But 
the Anglo-Saxons looked in the archives and found it simply wasn't so. Many revolutionaries were nobles. Many of the bourgeois were not rising and there wasn't much difference between nobles and bourgeois anyway. Of course, this is open to discussion, but an interesting observation nonetheless. So yes, I'm in favor of revisionism because everything that the institutionalized historians are writing should be revised constantly. I am also reminded of, um, as a point of departure, I see two interesting approaches having lived in Japan. When I was in the embassy, I was always amazed. The South Africans in the embassy in Tokyo, if there was a crisis, a burmaka plan, people jumped into action and everyone would do their bit. The Japanese staff would go to pieces. Domino effect, the one can't function without the other. The Japanese look at detail, they look only at detail and they don't look at the bigger picture. Now I'm generalizing, but this is my observation. And then I realized that as, as a Westerner, so-called Westerner myself, we look at the bigger picture far too much and far too little at the smaller picture. So it just makes good sense to balance the two, which is back to the scales of justice, which is an old Western, over centuries we've come to this conclusion, this realization that you need to balance the scales. And the same applies in the Eastern thinking, yin and yang, we need harmony. And when it comes to research, this is crucial. And then two more points, clusters. I look at clusters. I find clusters very intriguing because when you are researching and you combine the dots, you get a fuller picture. So I'm a great believer in, in looking at um, family networks. So this is combining individual people in the record, dead people as individuals and dead people in their social context. Because we are, after all, not just individuals, we are part of a family, part of a community, part of a society, and part of a country or a nation. Um, and then, of course, to pay tribute to my second cousin, three times removed, my great grandmother's second cousin, Yanni Smuts with his holistic approach. Yes, there's a lot to be said for a holistic approach. And then micro history as a starter, very important. And yeah, I want to quote Schiller, wonderful phrase of his, you have to go the rounds from individual to individual in order to gather the totality of the race. I firmly believe that as a researcher, and this is what I do, and I, you know, and I do it for my own reasons, I don't expect other people to do it. I try to retrieve individual people from the past. And I try to give them equal space, equal time, equal attention. Because I think only that way can you get a fuller picture of what went down at that time. And finally, my lived experience. Lived experience, very important. Um, a quote again here. Um, I, my racial composition and my position in the world are realities which I alone may determine. I do not expect to be told what I should consider myself to be. So yes, self-affirmation, self-identification, this is incompatible with ide identitarian politics. They talk about lived experience. Well, I'm talking about lived experience too. My lived experience is not negotiable. No one outside of my self will determine who and what I am and who and what I should be. And finally, just another tribute, Ola Schreiner, in her preface to her wonderful first novel, her debut, written under a male name to get published and outside of her country, because she never appreciated inside your own country, it seems. Then, Story of an African Farm, in the preface, she has the following to say about two methods of portrayal of life. And this is beautiful, I'm going to read it. Human life may be painted according to two methods. There is the stage method, According to that, each character is duly marshaled at first and ticketed. We know with an immutable certainty that at the right crisis, each one will reappear and act his part. And when the curtain falls, all will stand before it bowing. There is a sense of satisfaction in this and of completeness. But there is another method, the method of the life we lead. Here, nothing can be prophesied. There is a strange coming and going of feet. Men appear, act, and react upon each other, and pass away. 
When the crisis comes, the man who would fit it does not return. When the curtain falls, no one is ready. When the footlights are brightest, they are blown out. And what the name of the play is no one knows. If there sits a spectator, who knows? He sits so high that the players in the gaslight cannot hear his breathing. Life may be painted according to either method, but the methods are different. The canons of criticism that bear upon the one cut cruelly upon the other. Okay, now we're getting closer to slavery at the Cape. Now I want to talk about, okay, so now pecul peculiarities of Cape slavery. You're probably all thinking, when the hell is it going to get to the point? I want to focus on some peculiarities that I have picked up in the course of my research. Um, I'm not going to do a comparative study of transatlantic slavery as opposed to Cape slavery, which is very necessary and could take a book and endless discussion. And I would encourage people to think much more along those lines. I'm going to assume for this discussion that we all have a general uh, idea of transatlantic slavery simply because it's been shoved in our faces for far too long. We've been bombarded with, you know, armors, uh, movies and Hollywood movies, and, and um, we've been roots when that was a TV series, which also was based on false research. But we've, we've, we, we have in our minds, the first thing that comes to mind is slaves being transported en masse in extremely horrific conditions across the Atlantic. And of course, it's always from a very North American perspective. Now, whether that's their fault or not is neither here nor there, it's just the reality. America is the dominant culture in many ways, and we are subjected to it, rightly or wrongly. But so let's, let's talk, look at, you know, what's different about the Cape? And, and, you know, I'm going to mention a few. It's not exhaustive. It's not the full list. Just first a quote from Hans Hirser. He wrote this in 1979, very perceptive and very ahead of his time. Let's read. I've translated this from, from the original Afrikaans. The question why some free blacks, mestizos and castizos, okay, mestizos is half black, half white, mestizos, quarter white and three quarter black, were assimilated into the white community while others were rejected during the 17th century and even later is a challenge for the researcher, especially interested in social history. It is clear that rejection or assimilation were not necessarily connected. If inferences can be made on the basis of data from this seminar, which of necessity are openly based on a limited amount of documents and primary sources, it appears that the norm for acceptance in the white society was a lot more complicated than the simplistic Christian or non-Christian or white or non-white dichotomy, which is still generally posited today, right? Evidently, the person not born in slavery had a better chance to be accepted into the economic and social life of whites, irrespective of biological descent. There were indeed many prominent free burghers during the 17th and 18th centuries into who were mestizos, while some white castizos still found themselves in a state of slavery. The state of freedom or bondage of a person evidently contributed to his position in society. To equate the problems of identity of the 17th century with the color problem of the 20th century, the following observation should suffice. It seems that white was sometimes black and black was sometimes white, with a large gray area existing between the two poles. This gray area must still be investigated by the historian, anthropologist, and political researcher, and genealogist, and hobbyist, and etc., and requires further research in the Netherlands, India, Portugal, and Madagascar, and of course, South Africa. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, so let's talk about freedom. What is freedom? Let's not go into the philosophical aspects because of time, but there are interesting aspects of freedom if we pose the question to ourselves. And we find concepts like zilverkoopers and leif eigen. I find these two Dutch terms so fascinating. A soul seller, an amazing concept. You sell your soul to become part of the company. And yes, a leif eigen. You are the you body property of somebody else. Go leif. That's the eigendom. Incredible how human beings can concoct these concepts. I think... When it comes to understanding slavery, we always need to 
really get to the whole question of freedom. Francois, Francois Valentin, he was a Dutch reform minister visiting the Cape, who wrote a, you know, a wonderful work, which of course is invaluable in terms of understanding that period of time. He observed the Khoi Khoi at the Cape, and the quote is classic. These, the men, are themselves the laziest creatures that can be imagined, since their custom is to do nothing or very little. And this is the life of the truly free Hottentots, the owners of the land, as they call themselves, regarding us, Europeans, the Dutch, as the greatest slaves in the world, with our so exactly fixed and precise way of life. If there is anything to be done, they let their women do it. A fascinating viewpoint that Europeans were slaves to time. Nothing commendable from their viewpoint. And I think many of us might even quite like the idea nowadays. Why be a slave to time? How silly and ridiculous is that? So pers pers perspective is so important. Um, when we talk about freedom, it's a long walk to freedom for every single person, historically and even right now as I speak. And the VOC, they granted European settlers at the Cape, Freibriver, a letter of freedom. Ah, how nice. You get a letter that tells you that you are free. Interesting concept. How free really would you be if you had to get your freedom from somebody else to begin with? So let's talk about the Khoi Khoi and, and slavery in general. We have interesting in, uh, views, a uh, window, uh, we can, you know, little snippets of, of glimpses. We have glimpses rather of, of, of Khoi Khoi life during the, in, inside the colony. So you have Krotwa, Eva Mirov, her sister, becomes a captive. She's married to the Chinookwa chief or his son uh, at that time. She gets captured in war by the Kochokwa and she then becomes the wife of the Kochokwa chief. So here you have the practice of captive wives. Then another interesting example that I have um, that I wanted to bring to your attention, the Khorachukwa they arrive at the fort and they talk to Van Ribbick and they ask him for protection from the Kochokwa because they say they will be made slaves by the Kochokwa and they, they implore Van Ribbick and the Dutch to protect them. And as Van Ribbick says here, um, this is the quote from the journal, this is Horo, the chief, coming with um, three of their elders escorted by our country guards and brought with them six head of cattle as a present. And further down uh, the paragraph, it says here that um, already they had pitched their camps in such a manner as is their custom when they intend to harass anyone to Benaun, so that they fear that the blow on their heads will be given them perhaps so soon as this evening or tomorrow, that they will be robbed of everything and with wives and children made slaves of the Soldanas, the Soldanas being the Kochokwa. And then, of course, in the final um, part of that quote, in consequence, these people felt as glad as if they had already been delivered from slavery. That was once the Dutch agreed to protect them. And a more engrossing one, and more horrific maybe, is when Klaas, Dorha, known by the Dutch as Klaas, the Suswas, or the Chinookwa chief, he comes and captures hands over a captive child to the Dutch as a gift. Now, this is in 1673, Van Riebeek's already gone. We are now dealing with, of course, um, this is 73, so that's when the, the commander, the Cape was commanderless, right? And being uh, ruled or governed by Froy Manto and his group. But anyway, so class, Let's read the quote. The Susa's captain class sent to inform us that he had killed two Honomahotan tours, our and his enemies, and at the same time presented us with a little boy about 10 years old as a slave for the company. He had spared him on account of his youth, 
on Skolt, but the child was restored to him as his captive. And then, of course, interesting comment, it seems that these brutal Africans have commiseration for innocent childhood, which, however, is not considered by many Christian potentates. Interesting, ironic, ironic com comment, I, I'd say. So, yes, we have a glimpse of um, some indigenous approaches to slavery. Then, of course, the next question, which is also important, but I won't go into too much detail because we're running out of time. What happened to the Hottentots? The question of, are they extinct? Was there genocide, ethnocide, self-effacement, economic marginalization, cultural vulnerability and incompatibility? Was it all a pre-planned plot by white people to, to wipe out indigenous peoples? These are all very open questions. So I want to draw your attention to two viewpoints that I think are worthy of contemplation. One is the argument that the indigenous people were responsible for their own effacement. They, by collaborating, by becoming part of the colony, they helped to eradicate their own culture. So do they disappear? Yes and no. With the smallpox pox epidemic, yes, to a very great extent, but culturally and socially, those that remain, they become integrated. And we can't pretend that they are suddenly now more indigenous than ever before. They are very much part of the South African landscape. And I'm a living example of, of that too, as are so many other people. So going by looks, it's not gonna be very helpful, I'm afraid. And then I think this very interesting comment by Richard Elphick, the American historian of, who first wrote about the Khoi Khoi, Note it was an outsider who wrote about, who first really wrote about Koiko history. South Africans were too late. When I was at university, we had to study this work by an American. And my, what went through my mind was, why are we studying the work of an American? What, what's wrong with our own people? Why the hell are we not doing this ourselves? Anyway, be that as it may, let's, let's read the quote. This is on the, on the disappearance of the Hottentots, shall we say. So thus the leading features of Khoi Khoi decline with the complex interconnections of its many causes and the predominance of broad processes over discrete episodes of diplomacy and conquest. For these reasons, Khoi Khoi decline was a mystery both to the Europeans who initiated it and to the 19th century investigators who vainly sought to explain it by a single cause, be it genocide or plague. For these reasons too, the story has hardly ever been told in recent times. It has few villains, fewer heroes and little of the drama that attracts novelists and historians to later phases of settler native conflict in Southern Africa. Yet the process of Khoi Khoi decline should be understood, and not only because brown and white South Africans still live with its consequences today, for it is a fact worth pondering that the European subjugation of Southern Africa began not because statesmen or merchants willed it, nor because abstract forces of history made it necessary, but because thousands of ordinary men, white and brown, quietly pursued their goals, unaware of their fateful consequences. Now, when we look at slavery at the Cape, it's important to ask yourself, whose slaves were they? Who owned them? Were they VOC officials, patrician families? Note patrician, because not all white colonists own slaves. This is another thing that people conveniently forget. You had to be rich to own slaves, and not every white burger was a slave owner or could even dream of owning a slave. Free burgers, there were some. Free blacks even owned slaves. So freed slaves themselves could become slave owners once they acquired wealth to buy and purchase these slaves. And of course, political exiles. There were many Muslim exiles from Indonesia um, or the Dutch East Indies and from Sri Lanka and from India that the Dutch, of course, dumped at the Cape. Lots of royalty too and nobility and religious leaders. And these were prominent slave owners at the Cape. Also something which doesn't get mentioned too loudly. Peculiarity specified. Let's go into a little more detail here. Um, an important point which 
I always remind myself about because I forget it too. Slavery had been abolished in Europe already by the 11, 1200s, even earlier. And it was only resurrected once the Europeans started trading with China. And of course, when they opened up the new world, the so-called new world. <clears throat> and when they happened on slave, indigenous slave owning societies, they tapped into these existing systems. So slavery in a sense was revived. But the Europeans response is so interesting. What do they do? They happily participate, but they keenly being, they are very keenly aware that slavery is not a good thing. So they don't allow slavery to be revived back home. So Europe remains slave free to the point that they even allow real slaves from outside of Europe to when they are brought to Europe, they are given instant automatic freedom when they touch European soil. Very noble sentiment, but it tells me that they always knew that what they were doing was inherently wrong. And I find that fascinating. So yes, there is, there is an aspect of European guilt that needs to be recognized. But I also would, would add a rider to that. I think that guilt belongs to Europe. It doesn't necessarily belong to me as a white South African. So I think we need, if we're going to apportion blame, then we should look to Europe. They've got some answering to do. So then further aspects, Asian caste systems. So Europeans were confronted with caste systems in Asia. The caste system is alive and well in Asia, and it's not a very nice system. In fact, I think one could argue that it's even the basis of so much of what became apartheid in South Africa, because the Dutch were very happy to, to transport the Kapong idea of segregated communities all living in the same space. You saw this in Batavia, in, in Jakarta, and certainly at the Cape, but to a less extent because there weren't such large groupings of different ethnic groupings, but certainly in Batavia, you had your Chinatown, you had your Nihon Machi, your Japantown, and the Moluccans there, and the um, different groupings of Indonesia all had their own Kapong. So they, they lived together, but separately. And of course, this was also, you know, a reality in terms of religion. Uh, so, you know, you have separation of peoples um, in the colonial context it becomes very interesting. But you see other aspects of the caste system, even in Europe, because when Jews were migrating into Europe, they were the outsiders, the other. And or even in the 17th century, you find Dutch jurists arguing that sex with a Jew is tantamount to bestiality. It's having sex with an animal. It's the same thing. They are not people, and they are not worthy of being recognized as people, and sex with a Jew is a no-no. And the same with the gypsies who originated from India. So you have this very dark side in Europe as well happening at the same time. And then, of course, the slaves in West Africa, you've got the, the sacrificial slaves, the virgin women who are killed as sacrifices to the gods. And of course, in a way, they one could argue they get some of them even get saved and transported away. Well, that sounds romantic, but of course, it's horrific. Interesting, nonetheless. OK, and third point, colonial slavery is a legal institution. So from a Dutch perspective and from a Cape perspective, slavery was very much a legal institution. It was a right to property. It was registered like land. It was a real right in legal terms, an absolute right, which meant that you had complete ownership over somebody else. But being an illegal institution, it was subjected to rules. And anyone who is aware of the, the problem with the, the, the EU and, the, and Brexit, you will know that the European Union is quite fond of affirming its belief in rule-based society. This is a very European idea that everything has to be based on rules, rightly or wrongly, but again, interesting. So slavery as a European institution is very different from slavery in terms of the Arabs or let's say the Indonesians who were also slave practitioners. 
or slave practitioners in other parts of the world, South America, Central America, wherever. Um, the, Europe, the Dutch, Roman Dutch law was based on Roman law initially. So what did they do? They fell back onto their Roman legal heritage. So it's very curious. You'll see Roman names. You will see Roman jurists being quoted in the in the in the records, and they based their the rules on Roman principles, Roman legal principles. So that meant that slaves had certain rights in terms of Roman law, and a certain place in society. They were not. So what I'm really saying is, Hollywood gives us an idea that slaves were just you know. You could take a slave and use and abuse them at will. In theory, no. In practice, yes. But certainly the theory played a part because people were not unaware of their rights, even slaves. And this is a point that I find fascinating in Cape Records. You do find slaves fighting back or using the legal system to protect themselves. Um, and also being very aware of their place in that particular society at that particular time. Okay, so let's just bear in mind that slavery at the Cape was a league, was rule-based and a legal institution. Uh, just a quick note on Krotwa again, there's a lot of claims that she was a slave and enslaved by Van Ribbeek. Technically not true, the Dutch never enslaved the indigenous population. And this is a crucial point because in Indonesia, being a slave, owning an enslaved practice um, practicing society, the Dutch had colonized and they were surrounded by indigenous people who were also slaves or not slaves. Whereas at the Cape, you had imported slaves from Africa, the other parts of Africa, from Angola and Guinea initially, and of course from East Africa and, Mo and Madagascar, Mozambique. So at the Cape, you, the, the, the indigenous population were very aware of their, their freedom. And it, it, it shows up in the records where they affirm that freedom, and the Dutch were fully aware of that too. Of course, it gets blurred later in, in, the, in, in, in the history of South Africa, but that's another time frame. Um, but interesting in the 17th century, where you've got this con the concept of freedom is very clear between you know, the Cape indigenes and the slaves and the free burghers, everyone's got there, and the free blacks who are claiming their freedom as free burghers and equal partners in the legal system. So seeing Crotwa as a slave, of course, is nonsense. It's presentist. It's you know seen from a modern perspective. She might have had to work like a slave, but she was not technically or legally a slave. And talking about rule-based systems, according the, the Synod of Dort, which was a reformed church gathering in Europe with the Dutch and Danish and English participation uh, and Italian Protestants, etc., they came to a conclusion that slave people were entitled to baptism and infant baptism was to be encouraged. This was a major move in terms of progressiveness. Now, I'm getting back to one of my opening points, and that was we can look back in the past and we should be thankful that we are freer than we were before. And we should be thankful that we've come as far as we have in terms of, shall we say, human rights or individual rights and other rights. Um, but this is interesting that even at that stage of, you know, from the beginning of the colony in Cape Town, there was this awareness or this willingness to incorporate enslaved children into the society and to give them some kind of hope for the future. Okay, one could argue that it's tokenist or, you know, was also um, designed to, to make them feel good and ensure them a place in heaven by being kind to lesser, lesser mortals. Who knows? Who knows? But being baptized was important part of being a free burger so it becomes vital and you start seeing lots of slaves becoming baptized and asserting their rights as christians uh, and of course it opened the doors to marriage and um, inheritance etc etc and uh, legitimization um okay um I've mentioned already, um, I didn't really want to talk about um, 
I wanted to focus on the peculiarities rather than differences as such, but I did mention um, that we are aware of the Hollywood idea of transatlantic slavery. Yes, so plantations and, and the Arabian slave trade with castration of men, which didn't happen at the Cape. Castration was not a way of controlling male slaves at the Cape. Um, in fact, it was, I don't know of any cases where slaves were even punished by castration as a matter of interest. And of course, proselytization or religious conversion, how aggressive it was in terms of societies. The Spanish did on mass baptisms, the Protestants were much more careful and did it on an individual basis, which is also intriguing and worthy of comparison. And then of course, the language aspects of, you know, what happened in a slave society like America and a slave society in South Africa, Afrikaans becomes a language, it becomes institutionalized and it's the patois of of this mix. And it's, of course, an open question of who started it first and where did it come from. But I think it's quite clear that it comes from all the groups that are intermingling. And, you know, enough said, uh, it's a debate for another time. But, but so, so interesting, because why did this not happen in America? Why did it not happen in Brazil? Why did they not take on this a new lingua franca and institutionalize it? I find this absolutely amazing that in South Africa, you had this, this awareness of we are different and we belong to Africa and we have to make, we have to institutionalize this language and make it different from the, the root language from Dutch because it's already a mengelmus of, of other languages as well. And, and the idiom is basically Hottentot, right? So because, um, the, the feel of the language is very different from Dutch, I think. But once again, open to lots of discussion. Um, right, so, and then ethnic breakdown, of course, this is an interesting aspect too. Initially at the Cape, you had um, all kinds of slaves, but then, you know, as the colony develops, you find that the Asian slaves become less and the African slaves become more, especially the East African contingent. So this is important for the demographics because why am I saying this? Because the early slaves who were a whole grouping of Malagasy and West African and um, Arab, there were Arabs, two Arab girls, they, make, they became part of the white community or their descendants did rather. But then later on you find with the, the increased importation of slaves from Madagascar and East Africa, the demographics change and of course the population increases and you then have a broader darker community that are not necessarily integrated so this this explains why we end up with different groupings or let's say this explains possibly once again open to lots of discussion and then um other things peculiar to the cape was the um Clothing restrictions, slaves could not wear shoes or hats or luxury items. So rules, again, there were rules that were, if you were a slave, you dress in a certain way, and if you were free, you dress in a certain way. But these rules are not, they're not unique to the Cape, because in Indonesia, you had the same. Batik wasn't only worn by nobility and royalty, and the, the people, the ordinary folk, were not allowed to, to wear the wear batik. So th this is common in all human societies that like to always separate in terms of power uh, and create hierarchies and of course um, assume certain rights or appropriate certain privileges for themselves. So like the color purple for royalty in Europe. Okay and then um, the, another interesting aspect about Cape slavery, the Minamur, um, phenomenon, slave mothers as surrogate mothers. I'm not sure um, because I don't do North American research, but I try and keep up to date as much as possible it was quite prolific. But we had a particular Minamur culture where we were lit our ancestors were literally sucking at the memories of slave women and Hottentot women. So that means that, you know, in a way, this is how the language was also being created and formed and shaped. Um, I think this, this closeness is very important. It, 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 it's something that we should 
appreciate and evaluate more more seriously than we have perhaps. Uh, another aspect, the nonya and the nai uh, concepts. So from Patavia, we inherited this idea that females were natural concubines, not necessarily people that could be raped at, at will, but there was a cultural, shall we say, practice whereby women could be domestics as well as sexual partners, in-house lovers, um, once again, I'm not going to go into the morality of it because, of course, that's open to, to interpretation. But here you've, you've got interesting words that have come into Afrikaans. Nonia, me noni, from the Portuguese donna, donna Maria, prima donna. So it means mafro, madam, right? Lady, as a sign of respect and used in different social contexts in Afrikaans, which is so fascinating. I was always amazed, was on, when my parents were farming at, uh, outside of Fjellersdorp, we had a, a domestic and Lena, and she always kept on saying, me noni, me noni, me noni, and I'd never encountered this expression before. But here was this woman on the farm, generations on that farm, who was using this colorful language, me noni, me noni, from an old Portuguese word. And nai, the word nai, which is so interesting, because I always thought nai came was an English, a translation of the English word so, which was, was a euphemism for, for the sexual act. But it turns out not to be the case because we it comes from Bahasa, Indonesia, right? Where nai um, is housekeeper or companion or concubine. So <clears throat> I've given all the details there, but I'm trying to move on now. Um, but if you go into the records, you're going to find free burgers and free blacks being described as nonyas. Um, very curious. And I still think more research needs to be done. You know, when, when was a woman given this title of respect? And she, her color didn't matter. That's the point. And of course, um, not all women at the Cape seem to be given this title so freely. Um, so I'm curious for future, in terms of future research, if we could ever find out more about how these words came into our language, into Afrikaans. Um, I've spoken about the plight of male slaves. I really feel very sorry for them. I have another, another soft spot for little boys in the VOC, because when you were a boy, a cannon boy, you were small and you could move between the cannons and carry the gunpowder and you could be violated in more than one way by the system. These boys had no rights. They were under, they were prepubescent, adolescent, and they were in a sense also part of the VOC uh, armory. And I've never seen anyone write about these boys in the VOC, what became of them. You see sometimes a letter of freedom granted to one who is a boy and designated as such. And we know now that like the first cutie, when he came to the Cape, his son came on a separate ship as a boy. So he was to pay his passage. He had to serve as a, as a, as a, as a boy on the, on the ship. And of course, we have many interesting sodomy cases uh, that reflect the abuse that happened in some cases. I'm not suggesting it happened in all cases by any means, because there were rules and there, were, there was a sense of justice and there were deterrence to these so-called malpractices as the Dutch would have seen them at that time. So all very intriguing. And then concub concubinage, the whole aspect of, you know, back to the nonya and the nai concepts, um, it's a fascinating study to look at Cape born women who and imported slave women who became wives or first concubines to Europeans at the Cape and how they could work their way up, as it were, in terms of respectability and societal acceptance. Um, a very curious quote. Um, in 1660, Baron Va Va Vanders of Varik, he was already a free burger. He was working at the Skir, um, which 
or on or I think or no, he was working at at um, uh, Van Riebeek's farm, um, which is Bishop's Court now, um, uh, Borsheevel, and uh, he was someone alleged. So this is an, an uh, a bit of I suppose an allegation, a bit of gossip, but he was alleged to have said the following by two people, Arndt Gerritz and Adrian Bastians. Uh, <clears throat> so made at the request of Barend van der Savarek Freeman here, that Tinas Fredericks of Wieseracen Sailor had publicly said, while standing before the gate of the Hornworks, that the commander Jan van Riebeek had come to the Bosheevel and said to Barend van der who lives there, has any of you men any of your men had anything to do with the female slaves and fructified, fructified them. This is a labor and translation, by the way. And that Barent answered, no, sir. That Ribic replied, Barent, did you have anything to do in the matter? Tell it freely, no harm is done. It is for the benefit of the company. Barent replies, yes, sir. Ribic answers, then go to the fiscal, the prosecuting officer, and settle the matter. No harm is done. So we can interpret this passage in many, many ways. Um, but I think we must bear in mind this is an allegation. And one can speculate endlessly why this allegation was being made and what Van Riebeek's role in this whole situation is. But what one thing that is clear, and this is corroborated by other um, uh, records, concubinage at the Cape was alive and well. But I'm finding it was quite selective too. If you, and this is where let's let's get to the um, let's talk about my Ansela, for instance, and and Van Riebeek's slaves in particular. So at one point, Van Riebeek had my Ansela and another Indian slave, Dominga, and of course he his oldest slave was Maria da Costa, Maria van Paliacata, also known as Maria van Bengala. Maria seems to have been very popular with a number of important VOC officials in the fort. And we have a classic moment where we, she is found in bed with the gunner, no less, next to the gunpowder room. In flagrante delicto, they are in the act. But more fascinating for me is who are the men who are actually finding them? Who are the men that, that intercept this moment of passion? They happen to be men that are also fathers to her children. <laughs> and suddenly you see a whole thing, uh, uh, this, 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 this moment becomes very, it, it gets blown out of proportion because they gun for the gunner and they decide to throw the book at him. And obviously he's moving in on their territory and he has to be removed. So they throw the book at him and they make all sorts of other allegations against him. And of course he gets charged for neglect of duty and not being on his post. Um, but he doesn't get charged for, for concubinage, which was a crime at that time, according to the statutes of Batavia. So very interesting case in point. I'm, I, I will be writing about this in more detail because I think it's a, a wonderful window into the goings-on in during Van Riebeek's time. Uh, but more importantly, I'll speak more about Maria herself because she has a huge legacy in terms of descendants and her the influence that her children played at the Cape, her daughters. Okay, so just finishing off with the peculiarities. Conditional freedom at the Cape. You could be freed by your master, your patron, or your patronessa, but they had the right to make it conditional. So they could free you and say, well, you know, you have to work for me for another 15 years or for the rest of your life. Or if you don't behave, you go back into slavery. Or if I'm going back to Europe and I come back in, in two years time, you have to be available again as a slave. So they could slap on all kinds of conditions. This is horrific for me, because also in terms of law of inheritance, the previous owner could claim a portion of the inheritance because you owned that slave and you, you fed them and you housed them and it was payback time. 
So the Dutch had a very interesting idea of, of obligation. You were never really free from your owner. And this for me is an interesting phenomenon because there have been some historians who've been revisiting our records and saying, well, maybe the free blacks were as free as the, as the free burghers. And in theory, yes, in practice, no, absolutely not. And this was a pitfall that Carl Schumann fell into because he thought that once Arm Hussein class was freed, she was, you know, she was a self-made woman and through her, um, her own individual ability, she was able to get where she got to. Not true. She had a family network that helped her to get where she got to. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't at all um, that simple because once she was free, half of her family got to be incorporated into the Christian white community and the other half never had that fortune. So what went wrong? Or how did it come to be that, it, you know, they didn't all get the same, um, the same privileges in the end? Um, these are questions that, that, you know, beg questioning, I think. Um, okay, wealth accumulation in bondage, a very curious phenomenon. Um, after the first 20 years of the Cape, you suddenly find that slaves not only have to buy their freedom and not only have to be baptized, not only have to speak Dutch, but they also have to pay in terms of a, a substitute slave. And this became a new convention where you had to find another slave, a man usually, this is where I feel sorry for the men, who th could replace you so that you could become free. And we see a lot of these manumissions in the records for the Council of, of Policy when they um, approve these applications for, for freedom. So you have the strange practice of find the question that arises, where did these slaves get the money to buy other slaves so that they could become free? And I haven't seen anyone really write about this at all. Um, right. Uh, and then slave contact with Batavia. We've got wonderful cases where slaves like my class here of Angola and Maria da Costa and Maria Domingo. Maria Domingo actually goes back to, to the east, but not, she's from Bengal, but she ends up going to Batavia with her husband, who's also, he's actually a Chinese, um, a free Chinese man, and they go back to Batavia and they come back to the Cape. So you've got this interesting move, movement of slaves or ex-slaves that are actually moving between Asia and Africa. So there's a, you know, we tend to think that once you get to the Cape, you never leave and everything becomes cocooned. Well, not so. My class is, um, Grandson was corresponding with his cousins in Batavia, and Maria da Costa's family were also, you know, when the inheritance comes into view, they, some of the family were inheriting in Batavia while the family was dying at the Cape. This shows interconnectedness. It shows that, you know, the Cape was very much connected to Batavia in an ongoing way. Another interesting aspect is slaves taken to Europe and given automatic freedom on arrival. I've mentioned this before, but we have the curious case of Armazine's daughter, Maria Stewart, and Klaas Jonas, who's also one of her, it's her grandson. They end up being taken to Europe and getting their freedom. Another curious aspect, I have not seen any literature on what happens to those people when they end up in Europe. I've never seen any Dutch historians write about them or you know, reveal what, you know, what became of them. And there were a number of slaves at the Cape that were shipped as private attendants of retiring VOC officials and taken back to the Netherlands. What became of these people? The, the records are there, but no one's looked at them, as far as I know. And I'm hoping that this is going to also reveal so much more because we know that, you know, some of them were leaving family behind in, in, at the Cape when they were going to Europe. And, you know, what did they come back? Did they ever have any communication thereafter, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then cruelty towards slaves, another hot topic. We've got very interesting cases of slaves being badly treated by masters. Once again, this is not to say that it happened all of the time by everyone. It certainly happened and the degree to which it happened 
once again, that should be investigated. Um, there's some really horrific cases, but there are also, it seems to me, many cases where there wasn't such kind of maltreatment and that you had more of a, a patriarchal or shall we say uh, paternalistic approach to slavery where they were tolerated as members of the family or semi-accommodated or totally accommodated case by case as the Japanese love to say when they speak English very case by case special treatment yes why do why do slaves like my Ansela and Yanakia Bort, who are both important stom mudders of, of, of many South Africans, why did they get such preferential treatment as opposed to other slave women? My Ansela is a very curious case. She has four illegitimate children by two different men. Three by, one by Francois de Quinninck, who's in the garrison, and three by Johann van Us, also in the garrison. Both leave the Cape because they on temp they temporary, they're not colonists. And she, she then gets her freedom with her children and then gets to marry the first Basson. Why he would agree to marry a slave woman with four children that are not his own baffles me. I think it can be explained, but certainly a fascinating scenario. What did she have to, to what did he have to, to, for that union to work? And her success is also phenomenal in terms of dying as one of the richest women at the Cape at the time, and a slave owner in her own right, who doesn't even free any of her own slaves. Unlike some of her white counterparts who feel the need to free their slaves before they die because there's a sense of conscience, bad conscience, or a hope to get a ticket to heaven, who knows? But interesting, why, why, why? Um, the joys of research, always looking for the answers and never finding them. Uh, then to I next point I want to quickly touch on, um, yes, the question of adversity. It's very popular for writers, and I've seen it recently with um, Margaret Cairns did that with Armazine, Skuman followed, um, Hislop recently also referring to Margaret Cairns's research about a slave owning family of valuable property in Cape Town, saying that, you know, these people were amazing because, you know, despite the adversity, they could do what they did. Yes, yes, but more context. They couldn't do it alone, and they, there had to be some kind of network in place for them to be able to do that. And this is what this talk I was hoping to bring to your attention. I was hoping to show you that we need to look even more, even closer to, to this to, to find the answers. Um, and one of the answers is the dynasties that I have mentioned and not hardly spoken about yet. Okay, so... <clears throat> Just, I'm going to go very quickly now. Um, other categories, another point, there's a very important distinction between private slave and company slave. Important here was the access to education. Slaves could not gather wealth in terms of money, but they certainly could gather power in terms of education. And, and education was never a priority for the Dutch at the Cape. Protestants like money and God less. And it's very interesting, of course, generalization, but you find at the Cape that education was relegated to the slaves, even for the white children or the officials and, and the upper crust. And um, the slaves could ensconce themselves. They could basically build up a, a power basis because they were doing the educating. And this gave them tremendous entrance into society. So, and, and it played a very important part in this dynasty formation. Um, private slaves too, some of them got really good upbringing, whereas, you know, company slaves not necessarily so, and sometimes the other way around. Um, of course, one would ask to what extent did the personal attributes of the slave play a part? And of course, some in some cases, and maybe all cases, the personal attributes have to be taken into consideration as well. And then just further uh, adding to this, um, 
better life than before? This is a very difficult question. Would it be better to be a slave back in Bengal? Or would it be better to be a slave back in Sri Lanka? Would it be better to be a slave back in Indonesia than to be a slave at the Cape and then to become freed and have an opportunity to have a life thereafter? This for me is a fascinating question. I, in many ways, am very thankful that my ancestors that were slaves were able to be freed from their home countries. It's with trepidation that I entered Indonesia because for me, it was like going backwards. How can I go to a country that aborted my ancestors? It's, it's not a comfortable feeling to go to a place where you know the people didn't want your own ancestors happy to ship them off or sell them to the Dutch so that they could you know, disappear. Um, so the better life idea, you know, slavery. So what I'm getting at here is like colonialism, slavery has its positive outcomes too. Not positive enough, maybe. Nevertheless, there's some positivity. It's not all bad. Uh, and then back to the legal system and the rules. The Dutch have this wonderful phrase, Ian Mudder Markt, Ian Bastard. This is such an interesting legal concept in Roman Dutch law. Um, of course, it's, it's a bit contradictory because people conceived out of adultery and incest were still uh, outcasts and never given their place in the church or in the afterlife even. But generally, all bastards could be legitimized ultimately. And for inheritance, um, this is very interesting because it meant that people at the Cape um, who had a slave background had a greater chance to be assimilated into the colonial society. Unlike the English legal system, which of course just never allows bastards any possibility of being legitimized. But if you were born out of wedlock in Roman Dutch law, in terms of Roman Dutch law, you could be legitimized when your parents got married or if your stepfather adopted you and you didn't have the this, this stigma of, of illegitimacy sticking to you for the rest of your life. Okay, finally, we are now going to get to slave dynasties. So Cape slave dynasties, family networks and colonial elites. So this is a follow up on an article, just the idea that came to me after reading Gerald Krunewald's uh, interesting piece on dynasty building, family networks and social capital alcohol pachters and the development of a colonial elite at the Cape of Good Hope. And he did a, a very, his PhD was based on this, on the whole question of the pachters, you know, monopolies at the Cape and how people like Eckstein, who was possibly Jewish, but who was an Afrikaans stomfather, one of the, the progenitors of the Eckstein family. And of course, his father-in-law, Michiel Haynes, who was a German from Leipzig. And um, how did Eckstein become the most famous entrepreneur at the Cape at that time. He died the richest man. And of course, the, the, the research is fascinating. But it's more fascinating if you... Now, Gerald was very much aware of the slave connections, but being a good historian, it was going to take too much time and trouble to go into the slave side because the records are difficult to, to access and to, to put together, to reassemble. So he does hint at it, but he, but it, there's so much more that can be told about the story. And so the dynasty building is, a, is clear in terms of the white community, but it's not so clear in terms of how did Michiel Haynes um, manage to set himself up without, without the help of his wife, who was Maria Skulk, who was born in the slave lodge, her father being the Fanamerva stamfather. And how did... This woman, you know, who is, of course, Armazin Tras's half sister, and the whole family, um, you know, she and her siblings, they are entrenched in the slave lodge and they are interconnected with the colonial society. And this explains so much more how, in the end, Extin could become the wealthy man that he does. My main focus is the commander slaves because they were the first slaves really at the Cape and the ones that were private slaves before the company could amass and, and, and uh, uh, its own 
um, group of, of laborers. Um, so the commander slaves were private slaves. They were domesticated and they had the opportunity to, I suppose, have a better life because of their, their inclusion in the households of the governor and his wife or the commander first before they became governors. So, of course, we have Krotwa, we have Eva Mirov, who was an interpreter, but never, and possibly a servant uh, at times, but never a slave. But then the real slaves, we have Kodo and Saba, who were possibly half-sisters. They were snatched by the French uh, in Madagascar, and they were dumped at the Cape and given as gifts, because the French were in desperate need of assistance. They their voyage to Madagascar and to the Red Sea had failed abysmally. They had, um, their ships were mostly abandoned and they had to get back to France. So they relied heavily on Dutch help at the Cape. So as a form of payment, of course, the Admiral Gilles de la Roche de Saint-André gave these two girls as a gift to Maria van Riebeek, to Maria de la Cairie, and this, of course, was a problem because, you know, every Dutch commander and every Dutch governor didn't always or could not always act alone. Half of the time, if not most of the time, there was always some kind of senior official who was docked in Table Bay and usually a commissioner sent by the VOC to check on the administration. So, of course, Van Gunz was happened to be at the Cape at that time and he said, no, no, no. This is not acceptable. These belong to the company. Private gifts are not possible. So they were then put into the lodge, or what became the lodge, and of course farmed out to other officials as company slaves, but as servants. So tracking their movements is, is quite intriguing, because we find that Saba, they get sold into private slavery, whereas Kodo's children remain inside the slave lodge and become teachers, matrons, and marry very influentially. And people like Armazine Class, who is Kodo's daughter, she ends up drawing up four wills. She becomes legal wise. She knows how to play the system. And of course, her family are interconnected by, you know, also intimately, uh, with some of the officials, like Nicolas Ley. So you've got, you've got this mixing of, of fluids, of blood and illegitimacy, but at the same time, you've got this kind of, you know, acceptance of an extended family, albeit not so legitimate. So this Asian sense of extended family, that the idea of the Nonya and the Nai and, you know, Indonesian extended family, so different lifestyle that was being accepted at the Cape or um, imported from Indonesia. And then, of course, the, of the slaves that Van Ribbick owns, he owns Anna from Guinea. Anna is important because of her daughter, Swarta Maria, and the Cologne family, they own, you know, Constantia eventually, they get to own Simon van Estel's farm after his death, sometime after his death, and they become one some of the richest families at the Cape at the time. And then we've got a more intriguing one. We've got Lobakia. Lobakia, of course, gets as a private slave after Van Ribbeek leaves the Cape. She gets sold to a German, also from Leipzig, Müller who is Angela's um, protector after she's freed. So they end up baking bread together. But Lobakia is intriguing because when Miller ups and leaves the Cape, although he comes back again later, he sells her, Lobakia, and her children who are all uh, mixed race or Holfslag, they cannot be sold. Because once again, slavery at the Cape was rule-based. So if you were half and baptized, or if you were a slave and even full blood, full Hilslach, full non-white blood, as it were, very difficult concepts. But if you were a full-on slave but baptized, you could not be sold again. So they join, they can join the slave lodge, 
but on a temporary basis until they reach legal majority, which for a woman at that time was 22 and for a man, 25. Once again, men had to slave for longer. Um, so you have, and you have this interesting case where Lobeke has one child who is not, who does not have a white father, who other children do, and they go to the lodge and they stay there until they get their automatic freedom at legal majority. But one is full at Hilslach. So Miller and Lobeke strike up a deal and he promises the mother that he will free the daughter and baptize her, which he does. And then he leaves the Cape. And while he's away, suddenly there's a controversy because now the Dutch are saying, but who's paying for her? Who's feeding her? Because she's still a minor. And um, Miller comes back to the Cape to find that, you know, there's a big contestation as to who owns her and, you know, where she fits in. And he then has to reaffirm that he did free her and that, and he gets his friends to also give attestations that they, they were responsible for feeding and housing her and that the company never, ever did anything to, to pay for her upkeep. So, <clears throat> and later on, this same girl who was given her freedom by Miller is granted land and becomes one of the first uh, non-European registered landowners at the Cape. She becomes really fascinating because I'm going to drop, drop a bombshell here. And I'm, I was two minds about whether I should or not, but she's actually, Lobekir, I believe, is the mother of Ansela, who was Ansela van der Kaap, who's the stammutter of the Comfort family. This is crucial. Very, very interesting. Um, and so the next question is, you know, what happens to Lobekir's children and, and to her descendants? And what kind of power or inside power did they wield inside the slave lodge? Because Lobekir's other daughter becomes matron. Um, and she features prominently in the records because she's baptized and because she starts her life outside of the company in the household of Miller and his wife. And she has certain attributes being a bit more literate, maybe a bit more skilled, a bit more worldly wise, who knows, but she, she comes back into the company when Miller leaves and she then gets utilized more effectively. Um, so what am I really saying here with this whole talk is we have to look at each and every case to find out what made these people do what they did. If we're going to really jump to conclusions about the whole impact of slavery, um, it's quite a dangerous business because the Cape was small enough. It's a microcosm and the population is very small. We owe it to these people, our ancestors, to write up their lives in the best and honest and most honest possible way. And that's really my, the biggest message that I have in this talk today. If we can just realize that we are dealing with individual people and we have this, I won't say sacred task, it sounds too grandiose, but we have this task, this responsibility maybe, this need to retrieve them and show them up in, in all their and all their glory and non-glory. Um, and it's not, a, it's not impossible to do with, with digitalization and it's not impossible to do with the, the records because they are, the Dutch were good record keepers and there's no excuse. It's just the time and energy that goes into it. And the good thing is more and more people are doing this kind of research and you know, the gap is narrowing. So, um, we are living in very exciting times if we can just keep focused. Let's just move on to other slaves in Van Ribbick's household. Maria, my class here, one of my favorites. I have a very soft spot for her. This woman is astounding. She's an Angolan slave. She gets shipped as a very young girl from Luanda to Bahia, almost. And then the ship gets intercepted off the coast of Brazil just before they can be dumped in, uh, in Brazil. And the, 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 the ship gets taken by the Dutch and they retrieve half of the cargo of slaves and they leave the others to die and with a few, um, some food and drink, but they take the best and they bring them to the Cape and they're mostly children. And that we now know, thanks to, I found her grant of freedom in the 
archives in Batavia in Jakarta. So we can safely say she was born in 1652, the year of Van Rivik's arrival, and she died in 1732. So she had a very, very long life. So she gets transported from across the, Indi the Atlantic Ocean and back again, gets dumped at the Cape. And when she becomes older, she gets used as a minamur to suckle the, the child of one of the VOC's officials, a Mrs. van Helsdingen, and then of course ends up in, in Jakarta, in Batavia. And then after her task is done, they tell her that she is entitled to her freedom. They send her back and she has to assert her rights and she does, and she gets freed at the Cape. But for me, the most amazing thing about her is that after some time as a free black, she moves back into the slave lodge, which she fulfills the very vital function as a midwife. And midwives in their own right had in the 17th century, I believe, a very powerful and pivotal role to play, especially if you were a slave woman. And it, it plays out, it plays out in what happens to her descendants. Because we do find that some of them get freed and some of them end up leaving the Cape for a better life, maybe they hoped for, and they return. Although born at the Cape, they return, inverted commas, to Batavia. And they correspond with their relatives at the Cape. And uh, if you know the wonderful research by Susie Newton King on Kubut's correspondence, Arnold Kubut, who was the uh, free black, who is the grandson of uh, my class here. And he corresponds with his cousins in Batavia. The letters are online and they are fascinating to read. They have, they have only been uncovered recently and there's so much more that can be gleaned from them. You know, there's so much more we can tell about their lives by analyzing what actually stands in those extant letters. And um, I'm really hoping that we'll see more research on that in future. It also opens the door for possible more existence of other correspondence between other people from the Cape with people or family in Batavia. Um, okay, next, Christina, another important woman. Um, she has descendants. I've mentioned the families there. I think you can read. I'm not going to talk about it, but the Van Bullion and Heitema and Bakker families. Francine van Angola, descendants in the company lodge. My Isabella, one of my ancestors as well. The, she's the ancestor of the Bayers and Essaysen families. Maria van Angola and Maria Pikenein van Angola who is the ancestor of the Voortrekker secretary, Jan uh, J.C. Bankius. Very interesting connection. I connect to her as well through my Hottentot, my Barset Hottentot fourth great-grandfather, who is a descendant of Maria van Angola, who ends up in the Hottentot core and who gets land at Atlantis next to Marmory. This is where I come back to not all roads lead to Marmory. Um, and then, of course, Grote Katrain, I think you know about her. This is research I did many years ago when I first happened, thanks to Anna Biesikan's footnote, I could retrieve the original court case, which she said didn't exist, but actually did. And was sent over with Katrain as a convict. And the rest is history. Um, you can read about her. If you don't know about her yet, I'm on my blog or on First 50 Years. And the same applies to my Ansela. I think you know um, a lot about her. She's already almost, uh, it's, it's so bad now that if I tell people about Grote Katrain, they end up telling me uh, about her as if I've never encountered her before. So that's a very good way of knowing how well they've become uh, accepted in, in, in society, whereas they were completely unknown, say 20 or 30 years ago. And um, my Ansela, just coming back to her, for me, the, the weirdest thing and the most amazing thing about her genealogical or her legacy is that some of her descendants, they, they all worm their way into the Dutch colonial administration 
They all have cushy jobs and they're very wealthy, lots of slaves. And when the English arrive, they, they connive and they make themselves subservient. You know, they ingratiate themselves with the English. And some of them go to India, to, to British India, not just Dutch India. And they worm their way into the, East, the English East India Company. And some of them become prominent um, colonial officials for the British in India. They then return to the UK. Some of them die in Scotland. Some of them end up in Rhodesia. Um, some of them basically end up as colonizers, slave descended colonizers, um, slave descended English colonizers. <laughs> the mind boggles when you realize the ramifications of this. So um, I've written about that too. So my blog is, is there too. It's for free. I have put it out there. Um, and then just lastly, Dominga, she disappears. I suspect she died very early. And Maria da Costa, of course, is the one who is cap who's caught um, in flagrante delicto uh, next to the gunpowder room with, in the arms of the gunner. I, I will be writing much more about her, but her daughters, one is the first teacher in the slave lodge, Krita, uh, Macharita Jans Fissers, who is the illegitimate daughter of Jan Hrof, who is the founding father of the Fisser family, from whom I descend, by the way, seven times. He's my most prolific ancestor. Me, Mansell George Upham, has more Fisser blood than any other blood from any of my other ancestors. So he's a prolific, important, early Cape founding father. And he has children by two slave women and his wife, possibly two wives. And what's interesting about him is you see that he acknowledges the existence of his extended family. And even when his wife is his real wife is being murdered by their slave with an axe who hacks her to death. And he happens on this with his friends while they are gambling and they hear the screams of, of of his slave Maria van Nagapatnam, who's saying, Mudras do it, Mudras do it. You've got, if you follow the family through, you find that they, Jan Hrof was very much um, a part of familias in the Roman Dutch legal sense of the term. It was very much this extended family patriarch. And he, of course, leaves his estate to his concubine after the murder of his wife. And it's curious because he's daughter by, by Maria da Costa, who's Van Ribbeck's slave, who is caught with the gunner, she becomes wealthy and prominent that his children, you know, his own white children and his children from his second concubine that he lives with more openly and not so secretively, ends up being less successful in terms of economics and wealth and prestige and respectability and status. So once again, lots of food for thought um okay and so and and her other daughter just by the way was maria Hendricks, who was the oldest half slug born at the cape she's the first mixed race child born at the cape this woman ends up being a major businesswoman um she marries twice and dies very very wealthy and of course with family in batavia um, she's important because she marries Simon van der Stel's best friend, his bosom buddy. And van der Stel, Simon van der Stel dies in her house in 1712. And it gets more interesting because when you start following through, like who were Pfeiffer's slaves, they become the next generation of slave, shall we say, patriarchs or founders of slave families that dominate the slave scene at the Cape who become free blacks and then also become slave owners. So you start seeing a very complex colonial society um, coming into being. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I was going to talk a bit more about um, other private slaves, but you know, that will have to be for another day, I'm afraid. Um, yes. Um, I just wanted to finally say in closing, you know, two uh, very important. After 1713, the landscape changes dramatically. I cannot emphasize this enough. 
um, we like to think that everything continues from Van Riebeek in an unbroken stream. It doesn't happen. So the 1713 epidemic was devastating. It wiped out most of the local Cape indigenous population. And it also wiped out the free black population to a very great extent, which meant that new free blacks had to become the new, the new order of the day. And it also closed off the, the continued mixing of slave descendants with the, with the white Christian already mixed race community who then were in a sense able to become, dare I say, more white with increased importation or, or migration of European colonists and settlers and officials. So once again, the demographics start changing. And this brings me back to what I was saying about big data and, and how does this reflect if they are going to be trying to look at how our colonial society evolved. Um, so yes, and I'm just going to end with a, a very uh, with one question, um, I saw a, a Japanese vending machine and on the side was lettered blend is beautiful for coffee. And I thought to myself, wow, that's an interesting idea. Blend is beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm mixed race. I am Af Eurafrication, tri-continental. Blend is beautiful. I, I would like to think. So what do we have here from what I've been talking about? We have a reality of shared indigenous and slave roots across a diminishing racial or ethnic divide, and which I believe cannot be denied or suppressed. But what I'm seeing is that because people are people, we like to break away. Cain doesn't like Abel, and he starts his own dynasty, his own family, his own group. Abraham Ishmael in the Bible. Um, so now we're seeing lately a, an ideological pull towards diversity, and the outcome is seldom inclusivity. Now we are seeing dis dissent and exclusivity. So we're saying goodbye to the Rainbow Nation, and we're saying goodbye to color blindedness, which I think is really sad, but it's a reality. We are now seeing this recompartmentalization happening in perhaps new forms or, or recurring forms. Whether it's good or bad, I'm, I don't know. I'm just saying, look at what's happening. This is what I'm seeing. But it takes me back to many, many years ago in 1976, I took part in a, in a debate in my school at Hotton Dots Holland in Somerset West. And I, the, the topic was, will the two language groups, English and Afrikaans, come together in the future? And I was, you know, 16 years old. I had my de Villiers Palmer with me. I had, I had already started researching. I had already met a Dr. J.A. Hirsa and visited him at his house. And, and so I, I came to, I was the speaker in, the, in this debate, and I, I was going to speak in favor of the two language groups coming together because I felt that my grandmother was half and both my grandmothers were half, in fact. So I, I, I was living proof of this, actual living proof. And I stood on the, at the podium and I told the audience at school, I am a living embodiment of this. And here's the research of all many Africana families that are interrelated to English families. And I was laughed at. And I lost the debate. I lost the, the debate. And I was extremely devastated by this because I was a far better speaker than my opponent. And my arguments were far more convincing. But the crowd were into ad, ad hominem. The, one of the opponents in the audience stood up and said, and he was a popular head boy, who was a van Heerden nogal, but an English speaking van Heerden, who said to me, to my face, our groups will never come together. So I, you know, what did I learn from that? I learned that truth doesn't make people change their minds. Doma Strand is Doma Strand. And people, my grandmother was the same, my one grandmother. She said, I don't believe you. Eva Mirov is not my ancestor. I don't believe you. And nothing I could say would ever change her thinking. And cool. I'm happy that she, she was happy. Um, the point is, people, this is something you see in history. Dissent is alive and well and is a motor for change. 
people disagree, break away, start new sects, new cults, new religions, new political parties, new whatever. And um, when times are tough, they either come together or they separate even further. So in the end, we're still going to have clusters of groups that are connected and not connected. David was asking, uh, as mitochondrial DNA and strip being conducted to validate the maternal lines. Um, well, you know, um, I'm not I'm not a DNA specialist. I, I have many misgivings about the whole DNA testing. I think it's still very much in the um, early stages. Um, but my understanding from some of the sites that I do look at, um, people are testing and some people are, you know, managing to 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 find links to certain parts of the world. Um, so yes, um, some is being done, but you know it's depending on who's doing it and who has the money to do it and who is committed to doing it. But you know, I I, I work with the written record. Um, I don't work with DNA testing. Um, it's too new and too complicated, and I don't think it's um, we can really tell say enough about it in terms of in, of accuracy and and minute detail. And of course, I worry about other things too, like if I'm going to take a piece of my DNA and post it to America, how do I know that when it gets there, the person who intercepts the envelope or whatever, or you know, or the package, and then replaces it with somebody else's, or they mix it up in the in the, in the laboratory? So sorry, I I want to know that every stage of the testing is correct. So from an evidentiary point of view, I don't trust it at all. I want to know Maria Hendricks. Was her dad a slave? Because I picked up the first Hendricks from uh, Germany in uh, 1654. Um, yeah. you, you need to be more clear on that because there's more than one Maria Hendricks. Maria Winkelhausen, who is the stepmother of the Galdenes family, I think, or not van der Westhuizen, she was also Maria Hendricks. Then there was Maria Hendricks, who was um, born a slave. Uh, who is the daughter of, um, or the half-sister of, of Margarita Fissers, who was um, the daughter of Hendrik Hagens. So, uh, and then there's Mike, uh, Maria Hendricks, who was known as Mike, uh, as, uh, as a diminutive. Yeah, I know about her. Yeah. She's also Hendricks. Yeah, I know, but she was, her husband was Hendricks. She's the man Hendricks. But, um, so, uh, you... So who who uh, are you referring to? You, you to spoke about the Maria Hendricks. You know? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm talking about her being Maria da Costa's daughter. Yes. The yeah. oldest. She's born at the Cape. It's in her will. She's very clear about how old she is and very clear where she is born. She's yeah. Cape born, 1657, and um, she's Maria's daughter. You didn't do any uh, genealogy of the, of the Hendricks family? Well, you know, Hendrix uh, is just a patronym, so um, there's no one Hendrix family uh, that I'm not, not at the early no, there were at least 15 who came out, so I'm now looking at the very first ones to see who oh, they yes, okay. were, so, you know, I'm researching them. Mm, so there's Tillman Hendrix, Tillman Hendrix is my yeah, ancestor. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, but he didn't have any male descendants. Uh, Tillman Hendricks did not have any male descendants. Let me think now. Well, yeah, he had uh, his daughter was Yaniki Fisher. His daughter was uh, his daughter was Yaniki who married his Fisher. Yes, but but he had a stepson who took his name, by the way. Oh, did he? Oh, but it wasn't his own son. No, it wasn't he, his own. he he was known as as um, he took on um, Tillman Hendricks's names, and he, oh, did, um, he? Yeah. did he have descendants? He had a son who was banished. Um, he had a son because father and son they they were responsible for half killing the stepfather of the Van Berg family. They beat him up to a pulp, and then the son got all the blame, and he was then banished uh, from the colony. And they eventually, because he was married to Francina Kupman, and they had a child, they decided to um, to mitigate the sentence, and then they were banished from the colony, and they went to Mauritius or they went to went to Batavia. So the child was a son, but he wasn't. They had two daughters. One died young and the other daughter, I think, survived or the son survived. The daughter died. But, but I could just, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, if you're researching names like like patronymics, like Hendricks, Jans, Janssen, Jakobs, 
these are, of course, very, very difficult because so many people were using patronymics and they either changed or they were retained and passed to the next generations. And um, if you want to really sort out all the Hendrixes, you're going to have to research them all in that particular time. That's the only way I've been able to do my research. When you're confronted with that, you just you take every person, each and every individual, and you document them until you can join the dots. Mm -hmm. And it takes time, but it's the only way. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Mansell, for a very informative talk. I've really enjoyed it. And My thank pleasure. you for, for also mentioning Dr. Anna Brissigan. She is, it's refreshing to hear her name, you know, in, um, also in genealogy and historical research. Um, my question to you is, do you perhaps know the work of the first women archivist uh, at the Cape Town Archives Depot, Ms. Mary Kathleen Jeffries? I have, and, I, have, I have sat in the archives working through her papers, and I have great oh, admiration for her. Yes, she wrote yes. articles. She also wrote the first article on IFA, on, on That's Portland, correct. or Drum yes. Magazine. So she That's has a very special place, um, and she deserves so much more correct. recognition than... And unfortunately, she's, she's hardly known. For sure, that's so, so true. I'm busy with my, um, with my master's degree in history and I'm writing on both these women. So oh, wonderful. It's, so it's good to hear you talking about them as well. Thank you so much. Oh, well, you know, I'd love to tell you a little story about Anna Biesig and I only met her once. I went, oh, to, okay. I went to a genealogical society meeting in, when I was 16, I think, it would have been 76. Oh. And um, there she was sitting, she was in her eighties. And she, I, she, I don't know when she, didn't live much longer after that as far as I know but she sat there and I went up to her and started talking to her and she looked at me and she she had these beady eyes just like my grandmother and her sisters and especially my great aunt Hester and she said oh there's one thing that I still don't understand were the Stantlopers Bushmen or Hottentots were they Khoi Khoi or were they San I don't know this this is what I will still want to know and what I admired about her was that after all those years of her research, she was saying, I don't know, and I still want to know. And the, that desire, that, that quest, that fire hadn't left her. That passion, yes. What an inspiration. So she's, I'm, I'm sure. she's a real inspiration to me. Oh, wonderful. And I'm, I'm so glad that you know Ms. Jeffries and her work as well. And also on the miscegenation, you know, in South Africa and the articles that she wrote for the Institute for Race Relations as well. Um, and all the work that she's done for, and, and people not, they don't know, they don't know about well, it. Am, also, I am, poetry. Thrilled. I am thrilled that you are now going to be writing about this and we can, yes. we can participate in all your hard labor. So thank you so much. <laughs> no, you're very welcome. So it's still in the, in processing and yeah, but uh, we hope to have it done by the end of this year. So then she says, I'm a descendant of George Rex. And oh, it's yeah. documented his two wives were slaves. Where would be a good place to start the research? <sighs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, the archives. <laughs> the, the place to start is from the beginning with yourself and keep on whatever you can find that connects or relates, put it together. And one day you can finally, you know, assemble it and, come up with with the answer um but where i you know this is a bit out of my my period which you know i'm much more interested in the up to 1713 so pre smallpox um you know because george rex they were he was alleged to be the bastard son of king george the fourth or third right so that's been that's apparently not true anymore i don't know i don't that that's the last i re remember reading about about that story but he's two slave wives. There is a book from years back that was published on the Rex family, and they have the, a lot of information on George Rex and his wives. So I would I would start with that, and I would check the sources that are cited in that book, and I would, which is what you should do in every case, go and look at the records yourself. It's and digital if you can't touch them okay but if you can actually physically touch those records you would be so lucky because that's when you can you know besides feeling the energy of the paper you actually get to see the context of the record and sometimes when you read that record yourself you might see things which the previous researcher didn't even notice so go back if you can to the whatever 
documents survive, go to them and get copies or go to the original. So go into the archives or go online and make sure that you are looking at the source. And whatever is not directly archival and it's secondary or tertiary, just follow it back to the original source. 